As I look out over this vast audience, I'm conscious of the fact that the greatest number, on the main floor at least, are priesthood leaders. And I suppose the greatest group, the largest group among you are bishops. I have a great respect for the bishops of the church and for their many responsibilities. They are the fathers of the ward, the presiding high priests of the ward, and a common judge in Israel. One of the areas in which they sit in judgment is in one's worthiness to hold office in the church, to officiate in church ordinances, and to hold temple recommends, etc. It is the bishop's duty to counsel the members of his ward, assist them in their problems, listen to, their confe to the confessions of the transgressors, and assist them in their repentance. Unfortunately, many in the last category, because of their transgressions, are inactive, and they need much attention. Because of their sin, they feel they are lost, that there's no use trying. It's to these members out of the church that I'd like particularly to direct my remarks this afternoon. These are most all wonderful sons and daughters of our Father in heaven who in a weak moment or because of circumstances, possibly not of their own liking, have slipped, now in their despair and guilt of conscience, feel lost. An attitude prevails of, what's the use? There's no hope for me now. I can never be forgiven. By the devotion of a wonderful bishop who has never given up working on these individuals, they can be saved. When they learn there is hope that God is merciful, that there is forgiveness for sin, a beam of light begins to shine through the heaviness and depression of, of their transgressions. Listen to a letter that a bishop received from just such a person in this kind of a circumstance. There had been a beautiful interview in which the young lady had poured out her heart into the bishop. He had given her the assurance that all was not lost, that there is forgiveness for sin, providing there is complete repentance. And after a few days, she wrote him a letter in which she said, somehow you don't realize how bad it has been until the weight begins to be lifted. I know it takes time to make up for the wrong done, and maybe the best way I can express my thanks to you and my Father in heaven is to become the person that you think I am and that the Lord knows I can become. In kind of a funny way, I'm scared inside. I'm uh, not scared exactly, just a feeling of how important what we do in this life is. Life has always been, ha had so much to offer me, in the little things too, like being able to see and touch and taste and smell and enjoy, like a sunset or a baby's laugh or two children playing are seeing someone come to and overcoming obstacles in their lives. But there is always the baby's cry, the children arguing, and someone not quite making it. I don't know where I got this thought, she said, but it seems to be just right. I ask no dream, no prophet's, prophet's ecstasy, no sudden rending of the veil of clay, no angel's visitant, no opening skies, but take the dimness of my soul away." End quote. Brother Spencer W. Kimball has described just such a situation as I have referred to. Sometime a guilt of consciousness overpowers a person with such a heaviness that when the repentant one looks back and sees the ugliness and the loathsomeness of the transgression, he is almost overwhelmed and wonders, how can the Lord forgive me? How can I ever forgive myself? But when one reaches the depths of despondency and feels the hopelessness of his position, and then he cries out to God uh, for mercy and helplessness, but in faith there comes a still, small, but penetrating voice whispering to his soul, Thy sins are forgiven thee. End quote. The scriptures give us great comfort. In 1 John we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And again we read, For I, the Lord, could not look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, 
He that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. Possibly one of the most soul-satisfying scriptures to the trans transgressor is this. Behold, he who, repents, who hath re has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. President Kimball said again, as he used some very sound logic in sp explaining the call to repentance, the call to repentance from sin is to all men. The call promises forgiveness of sin to those who respond. What a farce it would be to call people to repentance if there were no forgiveness. And what a waste of the life of Christ if he failed to bring the opportunity of salvation and exaltation." End quote. One of the most beautiful scriptures has come from Isaiah, in which is promised the forgiveness to the repentant. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto God. And he will have mercy on him and our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Repentance isn't always easy. It takes great humility. It often requires superhuman courage, especially in the case of major transgression. But the Lord has told us plainly how we can tell if a man or a woman has repented of his sins. He said, By this may ye know, if a man hath repented of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. Confession and forsaking, then, are the two important elements of repentance. After one has been brought to the realization of his transgression and makes his determination to turn from it, he must humble himself and make his confession. It would be an easy matter to simply cease doing that which is wrong, especially in the case of major sin, and say nothing to anyone about it, but to humble himself and confess it to the ones offended and to the bishop is a more sobering matter and takes real humility. Following confession, the transgressor should demonstrate with good works his repentance, keeping faithfully the commandments of the Lord. Rest, uh, restitution is also an important part of repentance. Restitution to the degree possible should be made to restore that which has been taken or to repair the damage that has been done, to demonstrate to those offended by his acts his remorse and determination to make amends. President Harold B. Lee has expressed this beautifully. The confession, the confession must be made first to him or her who has been most wrong by your acts. A sincere confession is not merely admitting guilt after the proof is already in evidence. If you have offended many persons openly, your acknowledgment is to be made openly and before those whom you have offended, that you might show your shame and humility and willingness to receive the merited rebuke. If your, acts are in, or if your act is secret and res has resulted in injury to no one but yourself, your confession should be in secret and your heavenly Father who hears in secret may reward you openly. Acts that may affect your standing in the church or your right to, uh, privileges, uh, right to privileges or advancement in the church are to be promptly confessed to the bishop, whom the Lord has appointed as shepherd over every flock and commissioned to be a common judge in Israel. He may hear such confession in secret and deal justly and mercifully each case as each case warrants. Following confession, one in sin must show forth the fruits of his repentance by good deeds that are weighed against the bad. He must make proper restitution to the limit his power to, uh, to the limit of his power to restore that which has been taken away or to repair the damage done. End quote. After one has confessed his transgression and started in motion the process of the repentance, by demonstrating with good works his sincere desire to be completely forgiven, how then do we know when to forgive? How do we know he has truly repented? In Revelation to the church in Kirtland, Ohio in 1831, the Lord said, Verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, forgive sins unto those who confess their sins before me and ask forgiveness, who have not sinned unto death. Wherefore I say unto you that ye ought to forgive one another, for he that hath forgiveth not his brother his trespasses 
stands condemned before the Lord, for there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. In this explicit instruction to the Church that we are to forgive all men of their trans uh, trans trans transgressions, it doesn't mean that after a bishop has he heard the confession of one of his members, he immediately absolves them from all of the responsibility of their transgressions by his forgiveness. Surely he forgives. He puts his arm around them, is kind and understanding, and does everything possible to help them back to complete activity. But in spite of his love and understanding, he may have to impose a penalty, a time of forsaking, in which the individual is, is, is de denied certain church privileges for a period of time, depending on the seriousness of the transgression. Someone, was, his, his, someone is reputed to have asked one of the brethren, when is one forgiven of their transgressions? And he replied, when they have repented. Then they ask, how do you know when they have repented? And his answer was this, if you could look into the heart of an individual, you could tell. Possibly the repentance was at the time of confession, but since we don't know, there must be a time when the, in which the person can demonstrate his repentance through faithfulness to the gospel. The time of forsaking will likely be determined by the seriousness of the transgression and the repentant attitude of the transgressor. In a letter from the First Presidency to a stake president who was assisting one of his members uh, to receive forgiveness from the First Presidency of a serial, serious moral transgression, the following paragraph from the letter is enlightening. Quote, Confession and forsaking are likely are, are elements of genuine repentance and must be coupled with restitution as far as possible for whatever wrong has been done and the living of all the commandments of the Lord. There is a question as to whether or not sufficient time has elapsed to determine the compliance with forsaking, with the forsaking element. We feel more time should be required to pr prove this person can live righteously in the future." End quote. The General Handbook of Instructions of the Church indicates a certain waiting period after serious transgression before individuals can be given full church or priesthood privileges. But whatever the penalty, however long or arduous the processes, even humbling in sackcloth and ashes, repentance is the only course. Through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, our sins can be washed clear. In the words of Amulek, he said unto uh, him that the Lord surely should come to redeem his people, but he should not come to redeem them in their sins, but to redeem them from their sins. And he hath power given unto him from the Father to redeem them from their sins because of repentance. Now one final bit of assurance, that the repentant may be forgiven. Verily thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth upon my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see, the, shall see my face and know that I am. It may not be easy, the road may be long, but I leave you my witness. It is the Lord's way which he has provided in his mercy unto us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.